went up to the, the desk together, talked to the security airline worker who was working there. Just the, um, the Indian man spoke and he said, this man needs to board the flight, but he doesn't have a passport. And then the, uh, the worker said, well, you have to have a passport to get on the flight. And the Indian man then said, well, he's from Sudan. We do this all the time. And then she uh, referred them down a hallway, which was still in a secure area, and said, you need to go talk to a manager down the hallway. And, uh, you know, at the time, it didn't mean anything to me. I didn't know who these people were. It meant absolutely nothing. But a few hours later, as we were coming, to, coming down to land in Detroit on our flight, the African man tried to detonate a bomb on our plane. And he's subsequently known as the underwear bomber. Um, and I was pretty stunned after we landed and I, and I noticed that it was the same guy and I, I, uh, leaned over Lori and I said, Hey, I think maybe I've seen something important here. And right after we got off the plane, uh, the first chance I got, I told the story to the FBI and I've repeated it hundreds of times since. And obviously the media doesn't want to cover it. The government doesn't want to hear it. And, uh, you know, I've been stonewalled by everybody pretty much, except you and a few other um, people in the media that want the story out there. But, you know, that's what has gotten me uh, known, and that's why you want to talk to me, I'm sure. Well, the bombshell, though, is, and it came out with the Detroit Free Press and a few other places, but got no national coverage, that what the Undersecretary of State said, yeah, we were asked, quote, by an unnamed U.S. agency to get him a visa. And then here he is without the passport and stuff being gotten on the plane. I mean, this is incredible. Uh, about an hour after it happened, I, it was Christmas Day, I was going to get eggs at the local corner store for my wife. And an hour after it happened, they were already saying, don't worry, we're not going to put scanners in. And they were behaving as if they just decided to do this. But I had remembered that they'd purchased them and, well, started the order for them a year before. So it was a complete rollout. I mean, it had all the signs of a PR uh, event, and that's always a telltale when something staged. And then more and more began to come out, and then others described him as looking disheveled. Uh, I think you described him as kind of out of it. And, and so many times, it, it now turns out Amor al Fox News, AP, Reuters all report, number three in Al-Qaeda, the underwear bomber that uh, you had a, a, a visit with, with a little pop in his pants or whatever you, uh, it, it was you and others saw and heard. Uh, you've got uh, the Times Square attacker. Uh, you've got the Fort Hood shooter. Uh, you've got so many others who he handles, basically, as, as, as their connection. The CIA told Congress, we won't let you have his two years of emails to Major Hassan at Fort Hood. And then we learn he's secretly hanging out at the Pentagon while he's on the most wanted list number three in al-qaeda and now just last week the state department won't release under national security their records of the supposed number three of al-qaeda i mean at a certain point kurt this is getting a little too obvious and i know you like as a lawyer and as an american to you know just stick to the facts man like the guys from dragnet but at a certain point i mean this is as stage as a three dollar bill when the handler of this guy who supposedly almost killed you and your wife uh, is being handled by a guy hanging out secretly with the Secretary of the Army. What's your view on that? Well, you know, Alex, I've been on your show, I think, four or five times now. But the first two or three times I came on, I wasn't drawing these conclusions yet. I'm sure your listeners remember when I was on, and, you know, I wanted to stick to the facts and have the case build up to where uh, I actually believed what you're saying, that this was an intentional government plot, and at some point there became enough evidence where I, uh, I firmly agree with you that this was definitely a stage plot by the U.S. government. And I think any of your listeners that are having doubts to that, I think the best evidence of that is to go on the Internet and Google Patrick Kennedy underwear bomber testimony and watch the video of the Undersecretary of the State Department, Patrick Kennedy, as he squirms in his testimony at Congress, trying every which way to not admit that this was an intentional plot. I think it's very telling. Just watch how he acts. It's obvious he's trying to hide what we all know, those of us that are paying attention, and this was a staged plot by the U.S. government, and there's a lot of evidence that supports that. Um, 
not a stage plot with a bomb, but with a defective bomb. Um, you know, there's a lot of evidence that this bomb could not have even detonated because it lacked a blasting cap. And I've had discussions with Umar's, Umar, the, I'll call him Umar, the underwear bomber, his standby attorney, Anthony Chambers, who has indicated to me and even made a statement to the Detroit Free Press in December 2010 that the own experts the government has hired have indicated to him that the bomb could not have exploded, that it was impossibly defective. So how do you justify that with the uh, supposed story of what happened, that he flew you know, to Yemen, had this bomb sewn in his underwear, traveled back to Nigeria, to Amsterdam, to Detroit, or whatever We've it seen was. this footage they've released where he's got the hood on, and it looks like bad 70s uh, or 1980 Empire Strikes Back with Obi-Wan Kenobi when he's the ghost. I mean, it's flickering, put into the black. I mean, we're video people, and it's pretty easy to see that that's fake. Like the Bin Laden videos, all of it, it's turned out those are fake. This is really getting insane. And and let's just say it's real, though. Land of the free, home of the brave. We've got to give up all our rights and have our children groped, our wives groped, checkpoints, uh, TSA at proms, because a guy had a, a bomb go off. And I'm going from memory since I first interviewed you a year and a half ago, but uh, did you even hear anything go off? Yeah, uh it was quiet though it was more like pop 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 pretty quiet and uh you know it was mostly screen a lot of screaming and what really got my attention was the fire obviously i was watching the fire because this wasn't just a you know a bomb that malfunctioned it could start a fire and that's what had me worried the fire was spreading really quick and then so we haven't I, even gotten into the part where you land and the guy that's videotaping this is taken off and they say there's bombs get out of here and then later forget it that never happened I mean, clearly, there is a textbook cover-up going on here, and it's funny the State Department's involved, because studying and, and reading books by former Navy SEALs like Richard Marcinko and others uh, from the uh, uh, rogue team that he was part of, and talking to a lot of people in black ops, and the British have admitted they do this, they will stage dud bombs or flashbang attacks on their own embassies or on their own diplomatic cars from time to time, if they, most governments do this, if they want to get the staff more serious about security, if they want to get more funding. And this this dud bomb event uh, run by the same guy, Alaki, where the person's trying to light his shoe on fire when, when everybody knows plastic explosive is not lit, it's an electrical charge. I mean, it's the same thing. And even mainstream media in the last year has had to cover all the fake patsies that they recruit out of prison who who are terrorists mentally ill adult normally mildly retarded who who the fbi doesn't infiltrate they lead them and offer them hundreds of thousands of dollars if they'll bomb the christmas tree in portland or if they'll attack this or that so 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 clearly they're trying to manufacture these events kurt haskell uh, where do you see this country going what's your overall view on the fact that there's big sis at the football games and uh, big telescreens going up saying watch your neighbor and, and and see something say something with eyeballs on it on coffee cups i mean it's like we've woken up in 1984. yeah you, you know i could go on and on for hours about this alex <laughs> i have so much to say about it but uh you know i'll try and keep it short uh this country is going downhill it, it's time to leave this country it's only going to get worse Voting's not going to make it better. Those of you that are holding out for Ron Paul to win the presidency, forget it. It's not going to make a difference even if he wins. Uh, this country is not going to change. It's gone too far unless, uh, I'm not calling for this, but I'm saying the only thing that would stop it would be an overthrow of the government, in my opinion. This country is too far gone, keeps getting worse and worse all the time. There's no stopping it. The media is complicit. The, everyone in the government is complicit. It's a complete disaster. Um, you know, and speaking of the NFL, interestingly enough, I didn't know TSA was getting involved in the NFL, and I actually had tickets and went to the game Sunday, uh, Kansas City Chiefs versus Detroit Lions, and I got there 17 minutes before kickoff, and I didn't get in before kickoff because of all the pat-downs that were going on. Oh. I was kind of excited. Uh, I missed about the first five minutes of the game. But, um, but a point I wanted to make a minute ago, which I haven't talked to you about yet because I haven't been on your show since earlier this year, but there was a hearing I went to in the underwear bomber case on July 7th, and some 
some pretty interesting things happen. Can I, do we have a minute where I can get into this? Absolutely. I've been bringing up a lot of history and past stuff. You've got the last five minutes. You've got the floor. You're going to the okay. hearings, and that's why you're, you're, you're here. Yeah. So dispensing with the background, you've been going to the hearings. You're talking to the underwear uh, bombers, uh, lawyers. Uh, so you're giving us breaking inside info that the national media is not covering. So, Kurt, you've got the floor. Tell us all about it. Yeah, I, I figured that out. I started going to hearings, and then I would read the, the press reports about the hearings, and they would be totally different than what I would see at the actual hearing. And one of them was uh, on July 7th. It was a hearing. The, this hearing was scheduled because the stand attorney, Umar standby attorney, asked to delay the trial. And he asked to delay the trial because he said he was um, just before, and this would have been in June, so we're talking... 18, 19 months after the bombing. He was just given uh, a, a great deal of uh, what he called the most significant evidence of the case. And he asked for some additional time to go through and hire experts and to delay the trial, which is set for uh, a few days from now, starting October 4th. But it, he then went on to describe the evidence he was just given. And I think it's pretty interesting. If you think about what my theory on the case is that an undercover agent uh, from the U.S. government gave Umar an intentionally defective bomb and escorted him through security. That's what really happened here. So keep that in mind with what the evidence was that he was given at the last minute. A copy of Umar's passport. He was given a disk containing a chemical analysis of the bomb. Airport security video and audio. Uh, four discs of DNA analysis. I'm not really sure of what, but that's what he said. And then the last one was a witness statement from a, I'll go over this slow because it's kind of confusing, a Dutch non-law enforcement citizen government profiler who talked to Umar during the time in question. So what I make out of this, Dutch, okay, non-law enforcement, okay, government profiler, kind of weird, who could this be? Psychologist. During the time in question, I think this is the sharp dressed man. And I think the sharp dressed man was the per a person at the airport uh, in um, Amsterdam. They have a, an additional level of security, that being a security interview of some sort after you go through, you know, metal detectors. That's Israeli so style, I'm, isn't it? Yeah. So I'll repeat that again. Dutch. Okay. Um, Non-law enforcement, okay, he's not law enforcement, he's a profiler. Government profiler, okay, who talked to Umar during the time in question. Okay, so Chambers is being dumped at the last minute, this statement from this guy, along with a passport, uh, airport security video and audio, and a chemical analysis of the bomb. Now, why was all this evidence withheld for 18 or 19 months? To give him the least amount of time to go through it and hire experts to uh, to testify at trial over this evidence. Wait, I've got to wow. go back though. This is so bombshell because right. this is what you said originally. Only some 